This is Booked on Rock. I'm Eric Senich. Our guests, Paul Haggerty and Martin Hallowell, authors of Beyond and Before, progressive rock across time and genre. Called by Record Collector the most accomplished critical overview yet of progressive rock in one of their 2011 books of the year, Beyond and Before moved away from the limited consensus that prog rock is exclusively English in origin and that it was destroyed by the advent of punk in 1976. Instead, by tracing its multiple origins and complex transitions, it argues for the integration of jazz and folk into progressive rock and the extension of prog in Kate Bush, Radiohead, Porcupine Tree, and many more. In 2021, an updated and expanded edition of Beyond and Before was released. The 10-year anniversary revised edition continues to further unpack definitions of progressive rock and includes a brand new chapter focusing on post-conceptual trends in the 2010s through to the contemporary moment. The new edition discusses the complex creativity of progressive metal and folk in greater depth, as well as new fusions of genre that move across global cultures and that rework the extended form and mission of progressive rock, including in recent pop concept albums. Every chapter is revised to keep the process of rethinking progressive rock alive and vibrant as a hybrid open form. Paul Hegarty is professor of French and Francophone studies at the University of Nottingham, UK. He's the author and editor of 11 books that span critical and cultural theory, rock, experimental, and noise music, as well as audiovisual art, including 2007's Noise Music, 2014's Rumor and Radiation, and 2020's Annihilating Noise all published by Bloomsbury Academic. He's also co-editor of Bloomsbury's Eccentrics series. Martin Hallowell is professor of American Studies at the University of Leicester, UK. He's the author and editor of 14 books that span intellectual, cultural, and literal history and the health humanities, including 2015's Neil Young, American Traveler, 2018's Reframing 1968, and 2021's American Health Crisis. To hear a playlist of the music and artists discussed in this episode, head over to the show notes page. Paul and Martin, thank you for being on the Booked on Rock podcast. Great to talk to you guys. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah, thanks, Eric. So the original copy of this book came out in 2011. Great reviews, great responses from the readers. Did you anticipate the eventual need for an expanded edition, or did it kind of come up as years went on that, hey, you know what, we should add some more information to this book? We thought we had covered everything, that there was nothing left, that we had stretched the borders of Prague as far as it could go and uh, hoped people would be interested in that. Whilst not envisaging doing any more, I think there were a couple of things that we didn't fully get into as much as we wanted to. And some of that is like the, the fusion side, maybe expanding. There are always things we could have expanded. And like the first time, we just had to end it. We had written quite a long book as it was. So... It, it was very good to do a second one, but no, I don't think we really thought about it the first time. That's right. We, we didn't think about it at the time, although over the last 10 years, we've been talking about it a lot. The, the first, the first uh, edition is two sections. The first is before and during, and the, and the second section is called Beyond. Um, and it's the Beyond section that we've expanded the most in the, the second edition, but we've also remodeled it. So it's a three-part structure. There's a transitions and is the second section and beyond the third and there's lots of lots of new stuff we've expanded the folk and metal chapters particularly and then there's a new chapter looking at post-conceptual prog from the 2010s so that's where the new stuff has come but we've tried to go back and weave in more global prog we felt that that was something that we didn't do full justice to in the first edition so the idea of an expanded volume is Um, expanding it chronologically, but also expanding it spatially, geographically as well. Well, the book pulled me in with the cover alone. What a photo. Mm -hmm. I immediately thought of the late great Storm Thorgerson and his company Hypnosis, very Pink Floydish. And sure enough, it's a cover of a Mars Volta album from 2005 by Storm Thorgerson. And this is such a fascinating photo. It's for those who haven't seen the book cover yet. Two vehicles are facing the opposite direction, one man behind the wheel with a red velvet sack over his head. The car across from him shows a man or a woman in the driver's seat with the same red velvet sack over their head. It appears to be taken maybe early to mid-60s in England, I'm guessing. What's the story behind this photo and what led to you choosing this for the cover art? It certainly looks that way, but it's 
Thorgerson made it, went and took the photo in a small town called Stewartby um, in the middle of nowhere in England in 2004, precisely for the album. And the look is definitely, as you say, it's kind of 60s to us. Uh, I think it also looks very much like um, the kind of Panavision type coloration as well. So it certainly looks like that era, but it looks kind of cross cultural. Um, and it's a really odd town that was built as a kind of planned experiment. So what a great place for him to go filming. That was his idea of conceptualising how he managed to come up with any idea based on the Mars Volta lyrics is a puzzle, but that was his attempt to kind of visualise it quite directly, which is not always something that hypnosis were well known for, hence the people who didn't quite like the going for the one cover um, that they did in the late 70s. Uh, that Hypnosis would very often do their own thing and ignore the album. And this was really Thorgson himself trying to um, picture that album. So it's a pretty cool image. Uh, it's certainly one of my favourite albums. And Martin would be slightly lower down his list, I think, but it remains one of the best prog albums for me. Yeah, we both really like it conceptually as well because there's an inbuilt ambiguity into the image. You don't know whether they're pranksters, kind of Dardaist, you know, in terms of hiding themselves or masking, or whether they're terrorists, and also the idea of them moving in different directions as as prog itself does, that seems to be encoded in the, in the image as well. Uh, so there's something very suggestive about um, some of the themes of the book that comes out of that image, as well as it being very striking. You write, quote, to this day, mention the words progressive rock, and many will mm -hmm. conjure the images of long solos, overlong albums, fantasy lyrics, grandiose stage sets and costumes, and a dedication to technical skill bordering on the obsessive. Honestly, I don't see why that is a bad thing. I'm a fan of all genres of rock. Progressive rock is one of them. For you both, progressive rock is much more than that. It's incredibly varied. How would you define progressive rock? Uh, first of all, may maybe it's worth saying that we started talking about a potential book when we were both in grad school in the, in the early 1990s. But it didn't seem that, well, we, we probably weren't ready as writers at that point, but there didn't seem to be a way into progressive rock at that moment. I think that the Radiohead phenomenon later in the 90s gave us a way in because it gave us a sense of both progressive music becoming respectable again, you know, shedding that notion that punk had done away with it, uh, but also that it was moving in, in new directions and, and getting new audiences as well. So there's something, I think, about the, the idea of the beyond, which is encoded in in progressive rock, and we, we try and amplify that. Uh, the new edition's got a new subtitle, uh, which stresses the, the notion of time and genre, which are really important for prog. So prog is recognizable, but it's very much not one thing. It moves in different directions. Um, and it's that notion of movement, extension, expansion, that we see as being a, a core element of, of, of progressive rock. Where did that term progressive rock originate? That's one of the reasons we have that statement in there, which is, I mean, you're right, that the technical virtuosity can be really interesting and all of that kind of drama around the costumes. But we felt that that maybe cut down that potential that Martin's talking about, that stretching that we think is really big for prog in general. So then if we go back to the 60s, like that word progressive was out there a lot and coming from politics into music. And I think Martin really coming from his knowledge of American culture at the time was really interested in bringing that side of progressive culture in a very broad sense in. And then I was kind of looking more at maybe things like soul music and that idea of progressive music there with the kind of improving conditions and the music seemed to be something that was in the air. And then a natural kind of, in parallel, in a very different way in England, it was happening through something like the Beatles and those were very well-known rock phenomena where bands were just stretching themselves a bit more. And to capture that, they had the idea that this was somehow progressive and maybe overstating the case. So we've tried to bring all those ideas of progressive together. And I think that's something we've captured more uh, fully this time around. And I think we kind of vaguely knew it last time. I think we've stated it probably a bit better that it's all those things. And as you can see, and your listeners will be getting this as well, we've quite a very broad definition and we like parallel 
streams coming into it rather than saying, you know, on the 3rd of May 1968, X wrote this down or Lester Bang said this kind of thing. You know, whilst all those are good, we've really tried to kind of open those things up. So that's where we have the progressive is that kind of combination of things. The introduction gets into the emergence of punk in the late 70s and how it led to the destruction of progressive rock, that it fell victim to punk's return to basics. But you say nothing of the sort happened, and that was evident by the success of bands like Genesis and Rush during that period. As far as the critics, though, progressive rock was doomed from the start. Why do you think that is? It seems really odd. Like, if you look at... This is one we couldn't... We had looked at the questions and couldn't really come up with a good answer. But they did all state this was a terrible idea that rock's authenticity was going to be spoiled by all of this improvisation, experimentation, stretching everything out, having too many ideas. And that was just some moment where they wanted to go back and pretend no one was ever interested in that. And we really wanted to capture that silliness of that idea that whatever value the mid-70s kind of punk moment had, that it it was wrong about those reasons for why it wanted to do it. And we've seen it in the American journalism in the early 70s with people like Lester Bangs and so on. And once Pebbles comes out, it's kind of all over. But that retrospective looking back was nonsense. They're everyone, and they all creep out about 30 years later and say, well, actually, I had loads of prog albums. Or even Captain Sensible, who we quote in there as saying, prog is shit or something like that. So yeah, but actually, I had all these prog albums all along. It hasn't changed, though, to this day, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It, it's, it's like, okay, yeah. I, guess, I guess we'll put Rush in. I guess we'll put Yes in. Strange. Yeah. Maybe did the did they feel roll... that they took themselves too seriously? Yeah. So the bit that I think we accept is that by the time you get to like the mid-70s, Prog has got so advanced and has all its own games it wants to play and concepts and performance styles that if you wanted to be a musician and you were in the audience, that couldn't really appeal to you unless you were very specific middle-class audience that had access to uh, that kind of training. And that's, I think, one thing that makes kind of sense even now to look at it. But the rest of it seems like a kind of commercial decision that we need to say this was always terrible. What we're doing now is the great thing, and that's all simple stuff. And that quickly, within two, three years, The Clash is making a triple album. John Lydon has gone on. John Lydon, who was never shy about saying which bits of prop he liked, is making metal box and all kinds of cool stuff that to us feel like they're in the spirit of prog. So all of that has made it seem absurd to claim that this was doomed. But just quickly on your rock and roll hall of fame thing, I think the reticence there might be that prog bands went pop or that they became too successful. And almost if they'd stuck to their guns and become less progressive, I just did the same thing forever then they could be honoured by it. It's like Rock and Roll Hall of Fame understands if you do one thing all the time. Um, so maybe there the issue is slightly different. It's not even authenticity. It's you dared to have all these massive hits in the 80s. What was that about? And that's the neo-progressive rock era. Yeah. 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 So just just to chip in, I mean, what we want to do is to address that caricature of, of, of prog without you know being ashamed that some forms of progressive rock in, in the 70s probably deserve that caricature. Uh, but we also want to trace the punk moment into the 80s. So with neo-prog, you get more aggressive playing, uh, more aggressive vocals as well, if you think about early fish in, in, in Marillion. So I think the, there is an argument to say that punk helped regalvanize prog into the 80s rather than opposition. Can you talk about the importance of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper album from 1967? When you look back at the beginnings of progressive rock, most cite this as the moment. Yeah, so, so we've tried to do it two ways because I think there's always a danger, you know, of having a creation story that somehow it's with the, the, whole, the whole movement's born in, in one moment. Um, but, and we try and resist that by saying there's multiple beginnings and there's prehistories as well uh, that we can go back into the 40s and 50s and see you know concept albums and different forms of fusion uh, but sergeant peppers is too important um a product a, a concept a, a reality to, to ignore um what we like about uh, sergeant pepper is that there's a concept but it's not complete so there's, there's a lot of eclecticism on the al album um a mixture of high and low styles you know vaudeville and, and music hall are there with more 
um, virtuoso elements, you know, in terms of um, complex instrumentation and, and sampling. So there's a lot of of mixture and uh, multiple directions in, in Sergeant Pepper. There's a lot of mystique as well. If you think about the front cover, the cast of characters uh, with uh, the four Beatles, uh, you know, in their in their psychedelic um, uh, clothing, and then you turn over the cover and you see Paul McCartney looking away. So uh, whether they're playing with the audience or not, that notion of, of revelation and disguise is there encoded in the artwork as well as the music of, of Sergeant Pepper's. Um, but to go back to the earlier point, we want to say that, you know, in 67 and 68, there's lots of interesting concept or proto-concept albums by the Beach Boys, uh, Jimi Hendrix, Birds, Pretty Things, and some other albums I think we're going to go on to talk about. So I think it's placing Sergeant Pepper in a moment, which is like a matrix of different possibilities, but without ignoring its importance. There's also an important venue called the UFO Club. Can you talk about this club and its place in progressive rock history? Yeah, so we, we, we're interested in place and space. We've talked about the kind of global reach of, of prog, but we also want to ground it in particular events. Um, UFO Club is, is one event, but you could look at you know any number of, of, of festivals from the late 60s where you see different kinds of bands um, performing alongside each other. UFO is important in terms of thinking about underground events, you know, things that are grassroots growing up rather than necessarily those big stage performances we were talking about earlier. And that notion of a total experience as well, the happening where it's not just the music, but it's the events, the stage, the staging, um, the uh, interaction with instruments, the light show, those kinds of things. It's also important, I think, UFO, because it's part of an, an, a node, a, a combination of things. So uh, John Hoppy Hopkins and Barry Miles, Barry Miles owned Indica Bookstore on in, in Hoburn, which was really important in part of the, the London scene. They organized the 14-hour Technicolor Dream in, in April 68, which is important for early Pink Floyd, also important because you see John Lennon and Yoko Ono together. So UFO is, is, is one thing, and it's an important event space, but it's also a node in a, in a bigger uh, culture that Peter Whitehead and others captured as part of that, that key moment in, in, in London culture in the late 60s. The late 60s was a time when experimental music and drugs went hand in hand, specifically LSD. How much of a role do you think it played with the artists to come out during that period? Yeah, so we, we try and chart this in, in the book, in, in one of the early chapters, that notion of psychedelia being linked to the immersive experience of music. And that continues to a certain extent in the 70s, but prog rock is also um, tries to play both to the the senses and and the intellect as well so that notion of having a, a contemplative space is something that perhaps psychedelic music didn't have although it wasn't just one thing you know it wasn't just uh, a mixture of, of of instrumentation there were um different rhythms to it as well and, and play uh, spaces of, of contemplation but it's less obvious than you get in a more fully fledged prog in 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 the um, in the seventies. The other thing to say, I mentioned happenings in terms of uh, the London underground scene. If we think about Grateful Dead and Ken Kesey and LSD being part of that happening experience in Northern California in the late sixties, um, you know, the use of uh, oil wheels and thinking about the cross queuing of senses as well, stimulating different senses in, in, in new ways. I think that notion of the happening is really important and LSD plays a key key role in that. Of course, as well, I mean, we think about LSD casualties like Sid Barrett, um, we can go on to talk about, but also, you know, the swirl of colors on Moody Blues early album covers as well, you could say inspired by LSD art or you know, that, that notion of trying to capture something that's ethereal through a cover design. At a really simple level, you just can't imagine playing Yes's mid-70s albums on LSD. 
whereas you can imagine, you know, Dark Star going on forever and ever. So there is something about the kind of understanding of time. Just to take LSD seriously for a moment as a creative tool, mostly it wasn't. Martin mentioned casualties there. What can you do with it? You can't do those things, I suspect. Yeah, maybe musicians can tell us otherwise, but I strongly doubt that. And you mentioned Sid Barrett. Pink Floyd emerged during the psychedelic 60s. Author Edward McCann, who wrote 1997's Rocking the Classics, English Progressive Rock and the Counterculture in 1997, stated that they, Pink Floyd, became more of a progressive rock band when David Gilmour replaces Sid Barrett. They make that transition from psychedelic to progressive with themes of space travel, extended and intricate compositions. Would you agree with that? To a certain extent. I think it's important to realize that some early tracks like Astronomy Dom- Domini, which we discuss in Chapter 2, and Careful with the Axe Eugene, we discuss in Chapter 7, um, are important, or almost, you know, centerpieces of the Floyd uh, live live shows into the into the 70s. So it's not simply, they, you know, they, they, they throw off the the clothing of the first two albums and then a, and then a reborn in a prog prog guys um pink floyd sometimes i mean we see them as prog other authors don't include or wouldn't include floyd or, or even led zeppelin i think it's usually around you know virtuosity of, of, of playing um that um often um, they don't seem to be entirely prog we have an expanded notion of prog so they sit it, within it, both in the Sid Barrett guys as well as the the post post Barrett uh, moment. I mean, I, I guess I, I talked earlier about immersion and contemplation, and I think you get that more fully formed in post Barrett Floyd than you do in those first two albums. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. Our guests, Paul Hegarty and Martin Hallowell, authors of Beyond and Before, the updated and expanded edition, Progressive Rock Across Time and Genre. An interesting chapter on nature's place in progressive rock. And you write, quote, two major concept albums, the Moody Blues Days of Future Past and the Pink Floyd's The Piper at the Gates of Dawn provide divergent trajectories for considering the place of nature in progressive rock. Can you expand on that? We we come back to nature in the the later chapter on 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 the revival of of folk, but it's there from the very beginning. We'd argue it's really a utopian place. I mean, if you think about Woodstock uh, as that great moment of, of of coming together, often you know Woodstock's not seen in terms of the the three deaths or the uh, the almost destruction of the land in terms of the, the debris that was left at the end of the the concert. So we want to see the, the darker underside of nature, uh, which you see in a number of bands, you know, Jethro Tull, when Ian Anderson moves to the country, learn to love nature. But in the, uh, their early songs, it's a retreat from urban life, but there are also, there are also problems in nature as well. I think in terms of those two albums, Piper, uh, The Gates of Dawn, you know, nature is is an abstraction almost that is around outer and inner space. Uh, we see the big and the small. We see vortex into which um, we're, we're sucked. It's not very much. It's a it's a nature of, of nightmares or, or dreams that disturb. Whereas um, in days of future past, it's more of a, more of a pastoral sense of nature. There's a journey through the time of the day. It's a place of transcendence as well when we think about the nights in white satin. But there's still a, a sense of disturbance there that time's running out or there's not enough time to enjoy nature. It doesn't disturb as much as Piper, but it, there's still a sense, you know, that nature might be a habitat, but it's not a wholly comfortable one. It's certainly not a utopian one. The story of Jethro Tull is interesting. Their first two albums, this was from 68, Stand Up, 1969, more British blues and jazz. But when guitarist Martin Barr enters the picture, they stretch out. And as you say in the book, he furthers the band's progressive abilities. Where do you place Jethro Tull on the list of the most influential prog rock bands? Um, I mean, Jethro Tull, I think so. Um, I mean, Ian Anderson's just released a, a new Tull album. Um, so in terms of longevity, you know, they're there from the beginning, like, like yes, and, and they're still going although he doesn't work with Martin Barr in the same 
the same manner as, as he did early on. I mean, I think in terms of early Tull, you see a number of elements that are important to prog, transition from blues music or the stretching out of blues music, uh, using unusual time signatures within songs, uh, the concept album, obviously, from from at least from the the uh, the early seventies, in Anderson's use of costume and, and posing as a you know as a almost like a mythological character, uh, and also the, his his flute playing as well, which is important within the sound of Tull. But we can think about the role of the flute, say, in early Genesis that Peter Gabriel played. Uh, we can also think about Tull's influ- influence beyond, I suppose, the British prog tradition. Uh, one band that I'm interested in, Cold Fairyland from Shanghai, cite Jethro Tull as one of their, their key influences. So I think Tull travels globally as well as there being a, a sense of longevity to the band as well. Progressive folk. That's so interesting. The band that really stands out to me when reading this book is Pentangle. And on paper, I would think at the time, many would kind of scratch their heads and say, yeah, I don't know, but it created such a beautiful sound. There's a blend of jazz, folk, and rock. Can you talk about the origins of Prague folk and Pentangle? Yeah, I think we'll come back to talking about the, the female voice later on, but I think that's an important element we shouldn't shouldn't uh, miss. And I think um, in terms of some early bands like Renaissance and Pentangle, I think you know that they offer... Um, a different vocal range or vocal direction to some of the bands we've been talking about thus far. But it's important to, to recognize that Pentagon were playing festivals alongside different kinds of bands, blues, proto-prog, uh, psychedelic bands, etc. They weren't, although you can claim them for a, a kind of purist notion of, of folk, I think they do sit within that that um, cross-section of, of different musical influences. They're interested in re- reinterpreting traditional songs and myths, as, as prog bands were later to do, incorporating jazz into folk, so interested in time signatures and shifts of, uh, of musical direction. Uh, extended song forms as well, pentangling is seven, seven minutes. So I think there's a number of, different elements within Pentangle that that make them sit quite easily with some of the other early prog bands we, we, we explore. And they're also interested in the complex relationship to nature and time as well, which we, we've already been discussing. You mentioned early Genesis with Peter Gabriel and Genesis without Peter. Very different. But what's interesting, though, is Peter enjoyed as much commercial success as Genesis after he left. But I don't think it was intentional, meaning that the Phil Collins-led Genesis had a more of more of a pop sensibility while Peter's singles never really aimed to be pop with the exception of maybe one or two songs. It's really interesting um, that they both became so successful when they were both kind of having looked back at the customs from the time, they were both kind of doomed to fail. The Genesis was over and what the hell was Gabriel going to do? Because he had this kind of hiatus. And I think it was just seen as odd that first tour that he did that there's a kind of I think it's been officially reissued now that there's an American, short American tour. Um, what's curious is they both start playing, he starts playing some soul tracks and Phil Collins is bringing in his kind of soul influence. It's not a thing we play up too much, that element of Genesis in the book, but they, they both alter what their influences are. They rethink, restart. To my mind, uh, I don't know whether Martin actually agrees with this, we didn't put it in the book as such, they don't really do much positive thinking in the first couple of albums and then they hit Duke and they're off. And it's not just, they don't intend that to be more commercial. I I love that album, but they start getting successful. And so from that, I think they go, oh, we can actually do this. We're somehow hitting again, as we did already in the early seventies, we're hitting some kind of public here. And Gabriel, I think is the same that, well, I know this to be the case, and he decides in like 84, 85, that he can both carry on all his artistic kind of avant kind of side with doing things with Laurie Anderson and videos and so on, and actually have massive hit singles at the same time. So it's like they they don't start by thinking we're going to have hits, exactly as you say, but they don't mind it when it happens, and they work out a way to carry it on, not for a long amount of time in Genesis's case, as we know, 
And in Gabriel's case, the, the releases just get more and more distant from each other and many, many years apart. When he comes back in 2002 with that great album, Up, that's not at all commercial, but it really fits in with the time. Yeah, okay, that's a bit distant from that sort of period. But Gabriel, I think, would have carried on being extremely successful had he just brought out more records at the late 80s, early 90s. What I find interesting about those first few Genesis albums with Phil on vocals, he sings in a style similar to Peter's, where it almost yeah. sounds like Peter Gabriel. Then he finds his own voice. Because he didn't really... He wasn't all too keen on the idea of being lead singer. I think the other guys yeah. talked him into it. He didn't really want to do it. And they have on the early albums, when you go back, if, when we were thinking about this question, when you go back to hear what Collins was singing, okay, he's got his own occasional comedy songs that he does, but actually their voices are very blended. And Collins is singing quite a lot. Once you go back and have those nice remasters that came in that box set, uh, 7075 box set, then you can really pick out at that point. Okay, they're very trebly, just to be clear about that, audio files listening in. Um, but you can pick out Collins's contribution to a blended vocal. And I think it was natural for him to just follow that up. And Seconds Out is really interesting for that, isn't it? When you listen to Supper's Ready, and he both tries to put his own little spin on it, but really is sticking really very, very closely. You could probably mirror Gabriel doing that live second by second, how they're doing the intonation and everything. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I wonder when the moment is that he starts. Maybe it's then there were three, isn't it? That's probably when he kind of starts becoming more yeah. um, individual. Right, finds his own voice, uh, yeah. I think, you know, when he starts releasing solo albums with F Face Value in 81, I think that, you know, gives him a, a, a vocal direction, which then becomes which feeds into Genesis. So I think that transition is, is a subtle one over a number of years. And then, you know, by the time you get to invisible touch, it doesn't sound anything like Gabriel or, or Gabriel version Genesis at all. So. The religious themes in progressive rock, and we stay on the topic of Genesis and the album, the lamb lies down on Broadway from 1974, the concept and the story conceived by Peter Gabriel. What is this album and the song about? So one thing is that the lamb, is that like a Christian lamb? And I think from Gabriel's kind of interest in Christian mythology, it, it's got to be, you can't pretend it has no connection to that kind of way of, which would have been very familiar at that time for people to understand that imagery. But then the very little, you can read it all of that way. You can think about rebirth and so on, but you can read it as a pagan album. You can read it as a kind of, well, what's the word, agnostic kind of exploration. Maybe that's what it is. Um, maybe there isn't that much religion in it, but I feel that's kind of our sort of perspective is really to read it in a different way. But I think it's so full of symbols that it's designed for you to treat it as potentially very religious or spiritual in feeling whilst being really complex musically and kind of very hard to follow in a story. And it's, it's as hard as the Mars Volta concepts to follow. Um, in the 2000s. So what's it about then? Well, so Puerto Rican guy, Rail, falls into the underworld of New York and is stunned by this whole other world and then makes his way through this journey with all these kind of monsters and creatures and then has this weird moment where he's, he's also accompanied by his brother, John. Is it his brother? We don't really know. These things are just thrown in as we go through. And then it turns out that maybe John and Rail are the same. And a Keen listeners now will be thinking of cutting into the song "It" that ends the album, that kind of, which is also a joke about rock and roll and so on. We're kind of interested in it as a way of reading the city as well, and kind of how Genesis started to how they retained a kind of political interest from the selling England by the pound through to Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, which you know very very different. And Gabriel is really trying to say, "I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going on to something entirely separate." But actually, we see it as a way of helping the listeners to understand that all that Gabriel era Genesis is very much thinking about politics and history. Very vaguely, very abstractly, don't disturb the listeners, don't push them down one path, but it is about that in some way. And its kind of enigmatic side is the way in which they try and get us interested, I think. That's a very positive way of seeing it, but you know, we like the music, so that's what we're going with. Interpretation is everything with art. I just, I love that image of a lamb an innocent lamb and then yeah. and broadway with the big lights and loud commotion money fame yeah 
then it's kind of gone. <laughs> and then we're into some other new images. And then there's the kind of factory world imagery. Then there's the kind of monster imagery. Then there's the kind of hidden underworld of nature and just keep going, keep through the changes. But that setup of the New York, that's kind of, imagine also for English listeners that maybe not so used to big cities in the 70s or in Europe as well, this kind of drama that was being set up, which was a very different take on the kind of drama Prague had done so far. Um, very filmic, I guess. Concept albums. They're a big part of progressive rock. And this is something that I found so interesting reading the book. There's a connection that goes back to Frank Sinatra's mood piece albums and 1958's Come Fly With Me, Duke Ellington, as early as the 40s. You see that what bands in the late 60s did was basically complete those projects from the 40s. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so I don't know. It felt controversial at the time as a kind of statement, but um, it feels more common now. And people, I have read people uh, writing about Woody Guthrie as well. So we've kind of acknowledged that as well in the 40s, collecting songs. I think ultimately, as Martin said earlier, we can't um, ignore that there is a history which has Sergeant Pepper at the heart of it, and it has Beach Boys, and it has maybe Frank Zappa, Moody Blues, and all of that. So it's as if that moment brings it all together. And it doesn't mean that we're saying that they were listening to Duke Ellington. It doesn't mean that they were trying to literally do that. But these things were very well known. These are not obscure albums, Duke Ellington, Frank Sinatra. Um, Ellington took a long time making his concept pieces into albums because they were stage shows or they were hard to produce. And we talked earlier about the commercial side of Prague in different ways, about moments of success or saleability of the idea, uh, public appeal. And Ellington had that massive problem of getting an album which was physical because you couldn't make albums till the 50s. And then really it's the 60s where the business decides that it's marketable and that this is really a direction that everyone can go in. And that's how come you have the prog offshoot labels like um, Harvest and so on, which are designed to kind of, and um, DRAM come up with this idea for the Moody Blues to kind of uh, present this kind of uh, expanded piece as well. So you need a lot of things to come together for the concept album to be fully realised. But we think I, it's indisputable we can go back to Ellington, Sinatra and jazz. And just to kind of round off on this one, it's a thing that we felt was kind of missing from, you know, Macken's book is excellent, like Bill Martin's writing is great too. Um, we felt sometimes that the jazz side, that jazz input from into Prague was a bit lacking. And we've just been seeing all along people like Bruford and Phil Collins in particular drummers, I guess, talking about how important jazz was and they were playing jazz and Fripp is off in Bournemouth playing jazz. and uh, It seemed like a clear thing that needed bringing out. And one of those ways of emphasising that is to go all that way back into the kind of jazz singing of Sinatra and the concept pieces of Ellington. A concept album, it's one of those ideas, at least I always feel, it can either really work yeah. or not work at all. And I remember Kiss attempting a concept album in 1981 with music from The Elder. And they bring in Bob Ezrin as a producer, big name producer. You think, eh, maybe it'll work. It's gone down as one of the biggest failures in rock history. What makes a great concept album? And what is it that causes one to fail? Well, I think that's album's quite good. Okay. Yeah, I, I do enjoy it as well. I have to say, I do enjoy it too. And it doesn't hang around, probably because they didn't have too many ideas. It's surprisingly short for a concept. It's like, oh, we're, we're out. And you, you, it's finished before you know it. It's well, I, you know two. what, Paul, I should say, to clarify, failing commercially, right? Not failing creatively or not failing in the ears of music fans, but commercially. I think it's um, artists that don't normally do it are really chancing their arm. And a lot of artists have tried that in the 2000s that even we can't really include as prog but we kind of reference later on people like Madness and so on who tried it. And people kind of said, well done for doing that, but no one was really that interested and they never followed it up. So it's almost as if that idea that the punk music critics had has persisted in a way, which is you shouldn't do that. That's too ambitious for you. Kiss, you're a meat and two veg band. You need to get back to that, which they did, because isn't the next one Creatures of the Night? Creatures of the Night was the very next one, which is a hard and heavy album. But it was a, too late, uh, um, unfortunately, and it was 
appreciated in retrospect after they kind of got back on their feet again. But uh, yeah. Yeah, because it, 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 they've, they had branded themselves as something for so many years. I mean, I think uh, what would make a good, I'm not going to come up with a good example here. Maybe Martin can think of one while I'm going around in circles a bit. But I think it has to hit something specific at the moment. Uh, even if it doesn't hit success at that moment, we need to be able to at least later on say, ah, that really found some something to say about a particular time. And maybe on the peripheries of Prague, like George Clinton's albums are doing that, Radiohead OK Computer really tapped into something of the time. And maybe Gabriel's Up, which isn't the concept album, does a little bit of that at the time. And it's really finding something that's right now and making it musical as well as lyrical. And that's what prog can always do. If you don't have any prog idea in your head, you can't make a good concept album. And that's maybe what's thrown some of those other artists. Because it, it all needs to fit together. Like it can't just be this album is just a load of songs about one thing. I think, it, and that's why we're a bit suspicious of Woody Guthrie counting as the kind of, you know, source before all those other things and why Sinatra and Ellington is better because they have a series to them. So you need a series, you need all of that detail, you need a concept that ties it together. And even if it's kind of all over the place, like Sergeant Pepper, you bring that together in the artwork and all of those. So those are the elements if someone was asking us how to make one, but... No, I, th I think Paul's right that it needs to be of the moment, but somehow timeless as well. Um, so we talked about the, 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 the artwork on the cover of our book, you know, moving in different directions. And I think a concept does that. I'm, I'm trying to teach high concept film at the moment, and I can't work out whether Jaws is a good film or not on a narrative level, but it obviously is something that's easy to pitch to a to a, a producer you can tell the story in one one sentence so you need a high concept i think you also need something that that travels and you can take the listener on a, on a journey as well so i think like farewell to kings does that perhaps better than say hemispheres but thinking about rush albums uh, hemispheres doesn't it seems to float free of the contemporary moment when farewell to kings says quite a lot about government and bureaucracy nature and the city etc there's, there's enough contemporary relevance there for it to work but i think we also need to recognize that concept albums don't necessarily have one story that they tell through a sequence of songs um we can think about albums having song suites or you know one side is the concept we're thinking of 20 rush's 21 12 and the other side does something different or a song cycle again Sorry, all my examples are Rush, but the, the Fear song cycle, which starts on moving pictures and goes through a sequence of three songs on consecutive albums and then comes back a decade or so later with a fourth part. So concepts and concept albums can travel. We, we may think of it as one thing, but I think, you know, the, the edges blur and that's why it's hard to give you a, um, a postcard style answer on what's a great concept album we have we have our favorites but i guess you can debate quite more time than we have today about you know whether this or that album is is a successful concept um i think it's easy to point out the the ones that seem overblown um you know we were talking about the the caricature of prog in the mid 70s so rick waitman shows the, the, the king arthur shows on ice that that seems to be an overblown concept. Although one of my favourite prog albums, as it as a as a teenager, was it was is it called Acting Very Strange, Paul, with that that tinfoil tube that you you look look through, and the, this Rick Wakeman cover makes sense if you look through it through this uh, aluminium foil tube. Uh, so sometimes like novelty elements come in as well that can you know seem quirky or offbeat, but but can sometimes, you know, give you a different direction on what a concept is. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. We talked album cover art at the top of the interview with the book cover. Album art is noted throughout the book. The cover of King Crimson's In the Court of the Crimson King from 1969. It's among the most recognizable of them all bright red face screams and distends over the two outside panels of the cover the schizoid man he is the central character in the opening track this artwork is by barry godber the only album cover he ever painted we mentioned storm thorgerson's work legendary 
Do you have any particular album covers and artists from that era that really stand out for each of you? Well, I went and rummaged around through the shelves and uh, I was going to wave them at you. But um, I think King Crimson are always a solid bet. So you've got Lark's Tongues in Aspect. Aspic is um, very solid with that kind of sun face on the front. And then the integrated lyrics on the back and the lovely font and color and so on, just all that detail. And then the 80s albums, of course, they're, they're definitely, I think, a shared favorite of ours. I, mean, I forget who the artist is now. Gentle Giant in a Glass House, that's an amazing um, cover with that the glass, the kind of transparent strip. Listeners in North America will maybe be less excited because you couldn't get that in Europe. I got it when I first went on a trip to the States in about 2000 or something. And there it was just in a shop in Philadelphia for like $10. I was like, wow. So um, Wish You Were Here, that's another, you can't, you can't argue with Wish You Were Here. One that I chip in that might be a little less familiar is Hatfield and the North's first album. Uh, which is a beautiful kind of combination of the nostalgia. What you see is like a, a suburb of London, North London, uh, we think, and a kind of mythological fight happening in the clouds above it as the sun sets. And that folds out over a beautiful gatefold. So that's definitely one of mine. Actually, in the wow. 80s, XTC, I would mention, <laughs> give an honorable mention to. Which one? XTC, you said? Yeah, okay. I think as XTC get more interesting in the late 80s into the, like the English Settlement and Mama and non such, I think those are pretty solid colours. One of the things we've done in the second edition of the book is to include more art- artwork, and we're grateful for artists to, to, to allow us to do that. Um, James Marsh's covers for Talk Talk albums are, are really, really strong. Sarah Ewing, who's done artwork for Big Big Train, uh, we've got two of her uh, cover images, uh, both around crows in, in, in the um, in the book. Um, I had Marillion script for a Jester's Tear poster on my bedroom wall as a 13-year-old, and, and that's still one of my favourites, um, Mark Wilkinson's design. And he, he, he's done covers for Iron Maiden as well, so it's not just within the, the, uh, the frame of Neo-Prog. It's full of symbolism, and obviously Wilkinson has st- stayed with both Marillion and, and Fish, and has reworked the Jester imagery that you see on that 83 album a number of times. I also like Warrior on the Edge of Time, Orquin's album from 1975, which is a weird kind of gatefold because it, it kind of depicts almost um, like a cartoon image of, of Michael Moorcock Im- imagery on the front cover. But if you open it out, it becomes more phallic, more ambiguously sexual if you open it out. And on one side, you have a bigger image of the front cover but on the other side you have this shield as well that looks like a big pair of pants so <laughs> we t- we talked about novelty and i think it's an important thing you know that we always think about prog in being in terms of high seriousness but there's often kind of humor the hair that lost his spectacles the Jeth- jethro toll song uh, which kind of is in the middle of of a more serious concept album or the the high and the low you know the um the elements we talked about in Sgt. Pepper's. So I think when we're thinking of great cover art, it tends to be we're thinking about serious concepts. But I think the humorous side of artwork is, is worth mentioning as well. Just to take off on that, Martin, there's a funny one that Storm Thorgerson did for Steve Miller. One of his albums from the 2000s, 2011's Let Your Hair Down. And there's a picture of a, a rabbit, a.k.a. a hair, on the top of a bald guy's head. That's a classic example of humor and art. I'd like to give an honorable mention to failed covers. And I I really want to mention um, Lotus by Santana, which is really, really ambitious and wants to fold out like a lotus flower, but is so fragile, it it can't. Okay. (laughs) Well, how about Jethro Tull's Stand Up? Yeah. My my older brother has that. The other uh, few years ago, he says, look, I still got this. Opens it up and you see all the things pop up. Let's go back to that King Crimson album. You highlight the lyrics having to do with the Vietnam War. Blood rack barbed wire, politician's funeral pyre, innocents raped with napalm fire, 21st century schizoid man. Themes of war also a part of progressive rock. We know how much it affected Roger Waters, who purged his emotions in response to war through his music, but not all of the artists made it so obvious. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer's album, Tarkus from 1971. Is it about the Vietnam War? You quote Greg Lake, who's somewhat vague about that. Yeah. 
that's that's about as near as we can get like there's a, a big difference between the people we have in the kind of post-punk zone like this heat and a lot of the european bands that were had very clear political positions and they wrote political albums it seems maybe the english artists are the worst at actually saying whether they're on about something and it's not just enigmatic it's worry about saying it so greg lake seemed to be oh, i don't know i don't want to say yours is no disgrace by yes is another which is clearly about vietnam but there are they're quite reticent about that and i give you a good recent example which is we just about managed to get yes is the quest album in under the wire uh, to get the book out but we didn't have time to see all of the interviews around it um, and Steve Howe is talking about how we were always on about nature. We were always saying this. And we really had to kind of eke out because we wanted yes to. We, we saw that through the 70s, up close to the edge, topographic oceans, the nature under threat that we were talking about earlier. But getting them to say that. But, so Steve Howe says that clearly enough. But he says in interview after interview, and he's obviously suggested shall we say to his bandmates that they don't that they must not talk about anything more specific and there are many many quotations if you look at um the bondagazoo website a great website there um just constant quotations of we don't want to put a message across and in a way that's kind of admirable but if you're trying to as writers trying to find what that are they saying something or not that reticence is interesting in its own right but it's a bit frustrating uh, I think is, if the answer is, is Tarkas about it or not, we can't get any further than that vagueness. It kind of, it's in the air. A lot of prog at the time picks up what's in the air, like everyone else in culture is doing, and doesn't really want to do too much with it. And doesn't really, it, it's funny, they want to have their own concepts, which are tangential to that. And if Tarkas helps us think about war, you know, to treat it seriously, uh, as an album, or certainly one side of it as an album, then fine. If and we can, it's up to us whether we connect it to Vietnam or not. Personally, I think we found that that reticence, because we really tried going back and finding some more, because very friendly readers of ours did say, "Ah, oh, come on, close to the edge isn't about that." But, okay, let's go and find some more stuff about that. There's a great quote from the book. You write, "Arguably, the most successful progressive rock albums are those where the two dimensions, the musical and linguistic, the formal and semantic." are held in creative tension. It's a fascinating statement. Can you talk about how progressive rock bands use tension to tell stories that have a mythical theme? Uh, we, we've talked a lot about creative tension, I think, all, already in di different ways, and that, that seems to be foregrounded when we're thinking about the way in which prog bands use and retell stories. I guess one of the reasons, perhaps, that neo-prog bands got criticised for being derivative is that they seem to you know, take elements of first generation prog and, and, and reuse them. But we would see in that case, and more generally when we're thinking about combining old elements in new ways, we see the act of translation as a creative act in itself. It's not just derivative, it's creating something new. Uh, and we talk about that quite a lot in the chapter on, on, on myth uh, and prog. We're also interested in the way that myths combine different levels. Um, and one of the examples we give in the book is from the Beatles, in fact, where you think about Strawberry Fields Forever being the terrestrial, and then Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is the, the celestial or the, the transcendent. And you can move between those different levels almost seamlessly in myths and legends. Um, we also see um, you know, retelling of stories going in different directions. So often the stories perhaps draw from European folk stories or, or folklore, uh, but they travel globally as well and, and change and transform as, as, as they travel. So that notion of border crossing and transformation. And we talk in the final chapter, the new chapter on post-conceptual progressive trends. We talk about the centrifugal, the thing that disperses and moves out from the center uh, in surprising new directions. And myth can do that as well. So I think there is, there's arguments, you know, that the, the source is one thing, but we would say the source of a story creates many different things. And that's what fuels prog to a certain extent. Talking with Paul Hegarty and Martin Hallowell, authors of Beyond and Before, the updated and expanded edition, Progressive Rock Across Time and Genre, 
There were bands who combined rock and jazz to create what was known as fusion. And you say there are three important names, Miles Davis, Tony Williams, and John McLaughlin. They are the founding figures. Two essential moments come thanks to Miles Davis, In a Silent Way from 1969 and Bitches Brew from 1970. What is it about those two albums specifically that stand out? I'm going to give an honorable mention to Tony Williams, though, because that his two those two albums of that band are phenomenal, They're very odd, very avant, and the second one is almost punkish. So it's a great example of how prog tendency and punk tendency can put, go together. Davis, though, so those two albums, yeah, I was thinking about this, that in a silent way, both of them establish really long moods. And in the same way that more overtly complex albums you know, by Genesis and Yes, for example, do that through kind of the force of how much music is happening, that in a silent way is very, very stripped back. And Bitches Brew has plenty of that moment as well, because what Davis is able to do is corral all those musicians, very high level musicians, to play very little. And that to me, that kind of tunes in with Fripp's kind of idea, mostly about Bill Bruford, I think, or derived from Bill Bruford making too much noise, which is if you've nothing to say, then just have a little rest for a moment. And Davis was able to assemble a whole music in a silent way um, with McLaughlin at the core of that, re- clearly restraining himself immensely. I don't know how, when you hear those albums that he's about to bring out with Mahavishnu, it's impossible to imagine that's the same person. The sound is the same, but that restraint is very interesting. So those Davis albums have a really curious place in establishing mood through kind of stripping back whilst also developing themes very slowly. So they tap into, you know, Davis had already tapped into the kind of classical tradition with sketches from Spain and plenty of other extended pieces through the 60s. He carries on through the 70s, but we felt we had made enough of our point by reaching that sort of moment in his fusion um, history. And then the Bishes Brew has that kind of concept that stretches across the artwork as well, which is about um, cultural development and about assertions of African culture and how that relates to Western and global culture and so on. Maha Vishnu, on the other hand, is sort of like all the things, that if, you, if you're not familiar with it, and I was much less familiar when we were first doing this um, you know, 2008, 2009, when we were come bringing it together, is like accelerated versions of much of the 70s prog that was going on. And, um, whilst technically being totally jazz, it seems almost more prog at times, especially the um, In a Mounting Flame album. And as we know, prog rock wasn't and isn't just about the music. Chapter 7 titled Performance and Visuality. Emerson, Lake and Palmer used three gigantic tour trucks, a 59-member orchestra, six-member choir, a portable stage with a roof and hydraulic lift, a road crew of 120 for its 1977 works tour, theatrics. As you're right, this is before MTV, so this was your visual component to the music. But was there a point where it went too far? Or is there no such thing as going too far when it comes to putting on a prog rock concert? Well, of course, fans of punk would say that prog got too big, or probably well before you know the Emerson, Lake, and Palmer buses. But there is a, a sense that if the spectacle becomes too big, then it can you know dominate the whole multimedia phenomena of prog. It, it's just about the spectacle. We talked earlier about prog allowing it, it's about immersion, but it also allows the listener a space of contemplation as well. And you could argue that if the spectacle becomes too immense you lose that that possibility of being able to think you know you, you're just bombarded with with large large objects rather than being able to step back from the immersive element i, I guess often we we associate that sense of grandiosity with the arena we mentioned rick waitman's myths and legends of king arthur where there was an ice show going on as well um, I think smaller venues or different kinds of venues, perhaps, you know, wouldn't be tarnished with that same that same criticism. And it's interesting that some of the neo prog bands still touring in the UK, aside from COVID, like Fish and Pendragon, are, are, are in smaller venues. You know, moving away from the big arena venues that we associate with the the seventies and eighties. One of the case studies in that chapter that you mentioned, Eric, is uh, Pink Floyd's Live at Pompeii which is a strange concert because it's in partly set in the amphitheater in Pompeii in Italy, uh, which they, Pink Floyd, performed in um, 
I think it's October 71, that the Light of Pompeii comes out in 72. But it feels like an empty space. There's no audience there. And they're trying to tap into the kind of ancient Myth- mythical feel of the amphitheatre and then part of it's set in the studio in Paris as well so you, you get that notion of a blurring of the the live performance and the the studio creation of the music and we like that because it, it enables us to think about the the space of prog as well as it as a performance um, form of performance as well something very visual about it but it's it's about the blurring of the studio and the live playing of the music. Is prog rock better suited for the large stage and not for the clubs? Uh, I think you can argue it each way. I mean, obviously, first generation bands started off in small venues and there was, a, a I suppose, a progression there to larger venues as they became more and more successful. But I think there was a moment in the mid 70s probably through i don't know some point in the 80s you know when that the arena was the place of different kinds of music you know springsteen or u2 whatever playing in big arenas that that's a chapter it seems within the history of popular music rather than being the end point big isn't always better one thing to remember is that though after the sort of golden age first golden age of prog Prog goes underground and everyone's playing to like a couple of hundred people. Not necessarily, but in lots. And it varies, it's very different according to which country you're in. So some of the 80s bands like Pendragon uh, have big followings in Germany, Poland and Russia. Actually, lots of rock bands have big following in Germany, so they can kind of keep going in the European way of framing things. Some of them manage to still get good audiences in the States, as you'll know. But um, a lot of European bands, and I would suspect American ones that we never got to see over this side, are playing in clubs and almost know nothing else. So someone that became really successful, like Big Big Train, it's very sad about Dave Longdon, their level of success is doing one really big gig to 5,000 people or something. So that's what we're looking at today in terms of what an expectation is for newer bands who've only been going 20 odd years, 25 years or something. And I think the question is right. I think there's a type of prog that really works at stadium level. And that's actually moved on to other pop performers. Now they've taken all of that and they're doing that for their shows and prog itself, even the way we define it very broadly is really because it's now more avant-garde type thing. Even if the music's very melodic sometimes, is often going to happen in clubs. Many of those 80s bands have never had big audiences or played once or twice in their lives to a big audience. I'm glad you mentioned 80s because I'm thinking how it affects the music. Def right. Leppard, when Def Leppard was making Hysteria, Joe Elliott, the singer, was telling Rick Allen, because Rick Allen was stressing over symbols and what should I do here? He says, we're going to be playing in these huge stadiums, man. Don't worry about it. Just <laughs> just don't worry about what you, because you people that are way back aren't picking up on every little aspect of the instrument good or bad but that's yeah. i think that affects it musically especially if you're looking to do some interesting things with the music people in the hundredth row aren't going to notice either way i think technology has improved enough to make a bit of a difference on that and i think in the 80s because of cds and digital dat kind of stuff people thought we had arrived at the peak of music whereas i think whenever i've been to biggish rock gigs And I saw Rush, a quite big gig in Toronto, and it was outdoors. And the sound was phenomenally better than it would have been 20, 30 years prior to that. King Crimson was so precise. And I've seen them in a few big-ish locations, four or 5,000 people, not arenas. Well, mid-size arenas. Um, And bands don't play as loud as they used to. That sounds like a kind of old man statement, like, oh, bands don't do this anymore. But the control over the volume and the technological uh, way in which mixing desks are set up, I think is quite different now. So when I saw Devin Townsend, I thought, well, this is just going to be a massive, great kind of metal sound and it's going to be really interesting. And it was, but actually there was loads more detail and I didn't emerge from it deaf, which was quite surprising because they had hit some really good balance. So I think things have moved on enough to make all scales of music more meaningful. I think if you're in a stadium with 100,000 people and the wind's blowing, there's nothing you can do about it. Interesting. Yeah, sonically, there's been advancements. And we know with visual 
advancements, Roger Waters was able to take advantage of that with his presentation of the wall many, many years later. In 1981, it was a big thing, and they couldn't do as many shows. Now they can. But I want to go to Rush, because we mentioned Rush, or you just mentioned Rush, Paul. They're considered one of the greatest prog rock bands of all time, and it's Neil Peart who is responsible for a big part of the Rush sound, but also the lyrical themes. He's a standout figure when you explore social themes in your book. Peart is often categorized as an objectivist, believing in the concept of man as a heroic being with his own happiness as the moral purpose of his life, with productive achievement as his noblest activity. This system was developed by Russian-American writer Ayn Rand, who Peart admired. And this is largely reflected in his lyrics in the 70s. An example is the song Anthem and the album 2112. Can you talk about his influence among the prog rock bands and the artists who came after him? Yeah, well, we must acknowledge that that Neil Peart often comes top in the the best drummer of all time. So he's a talented lyricist, but he's also an extremely talented um, drummer as well. So I think that combination that he's working on a lyrical level, but also on a percussive level, and I think that's that's why Rush is so innovative as, as a band and, and Pert is so important as a as a figure um, in, in, in progressive rock history. When we think of Ayn Rand and, and Rush, it, it really is probably only 2112 and, and that song Anthem on Caress of Steel, where you can see it being a, a tight adaptation. But throughout Russia's output, you can see the tensions between individualism, you know, Ayn Rand being an advocate of forceful and determined individualism against the state or against mindless bureaucracy or or some oppressive uh, environmental system. So you can see that in Rush as a more general theme, which is inflected by Pert reading Rand as many many did in in the seventies, but we 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 look at it in a slightly different way because you can read Rush as being you know advocates of individualism uh, in very very different songs and and concepts, but they're also a tight knit three piece working together. There's, they're a kind of collective unit, uh, and if if for Rand collectivism is the the oppressor. Rush are singing about individualism, but also performing as a as a tight knit trio. And you know, you can think about it in, in a slightly different way. In um, in twenty one twelve, when the protagonist finds the guitar in the waterfall, you know, in this moment of of, of, of magical awakening, uh, musical awakening, it's Alex Lifeson's guitar that that comes to light. He's the individualist for that moment before he moves back into playing uh, within the tight-knit trio. So I think that tension between individualism and collectivism isn't an opposition necessarily. And I think if you just read Ayn Rand, it feels like one. If you look at the way in which a prog band like Rush animate Rand's ideas, it's more complex. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. The 80s, you write, can be seen as a watershed period for progressive rock. A band like Yes breaks up or splinters off to form a new generation of watered-down supergroups. I think when you talk about the neo-progressive genre, Yes is exhibit A. So many groups come out of that 70s lineup of Yes to form new bands and become commercially successful. We talked about Asia. Even Yes themselves move away from the long-form compositions to create more radio-friendly songs like 1983's Owner of a Lonely Heart. How would you define neo-progressive rock? Uh, this is the longest chapter in the book, so we're not going to do it justice here. I think we probably both can just throw in a, a few ideas. Um, and we've already talked a little bit about the way in which we try and rescue neo-prog from being seen as derivative of first-generation prog. Um, you know, fish wearing grease paint in early Marillion is, you know, maybe a homage to Gabriel, but he's doing something new in it. And, you know, when he's singing Grendel or Forgotten Sons or Punch and Judy, you know, he's creating a different set of persona, not in a derivative way. So we talked about the way in which the recycling of myth and the idea of translation creates something new. And I think we'd say that was the case with Neoprog. So although it can be identified by increased use of synthesizers, um, shorter songs, perhaps uh, punchier lyrics, uh, less ethereal. 
Um, so there's certain stylistic traits you could associate, certainly with first wave neoprog, so Marillion, Palace, IQ, etc. I think there seemed to be a moment, you know, of the, of the emergence of those those bands, Pendragon as well. Um, neoprog itself has a long history. It's not just the moment of the early to, to late 80s. And in the final chapter, we look at uh, Fisher's newest album, uh, possibly his last album, and um, and Pendragon as well, who came back in the the 2000s with a much harsher sound, both vocally and instrumentally, using a metal drummer and uh, Nick Barrett, using different types of tonality in his voice as well. So I think there's a danger of thinking about neo-prog as being a an isolated bubble in the 80s where we see it as something that has its own history which goes through to the present. I mean, that's one thing we slightly rethought from last time. I think maybe we felt we were a little bit more defensive in the first edition because we come in with Neoprog. For, it was new to us. It was happening, even if we may, might have been familiar with some of the other things. Whereas this time, so we, what we wanted to say was defend it in the first edition. And this time, I think we were more comfortable and we were able to, exactly as you said, Eric, to think of it as renewal and therefore, rather than just having Yes and Genesis having pop hits as something separate over here, but to think about all of those things together and what would it mean in a period that do you want to be prog or not? That's the question in neoprog. And I, there is still that difference that people like Starcastle in the States, we identify as a really, really early example of neoprog, which is it's doing prog as a style, or the band England, who did really only one proper album, Garden Shared at the time, so it's already happening. The Enid, those are kind of post, they're neoprog in the 70s. In the 80s, the bands we're talking about, like Marillion, Pendragon, IQ, and so on, want to be prog. and No one else wants to. So that's one thing. Nonetheless, that's a renewal. And yes, and Genesis are doing their renewal. So a rush by going something I had no time for whatsoever. Martin's a much bigger lifelong Rush fan than I am. But I was out of Russia, 81, I'm out, I'm done with this. What the hell is Subdivisions? This is nonsense. Whereas, of course, that's a great album, uh, whatever album that is. I agree. No, I'm, I, I'm with Martin. I, but yeah, Rush, it, it's really Neil was tired of writing the songs that he did in the 70s. Even lyrically, he changed, more introspective with the lyrics, but the songs become more concise. And So although, I come back in and pay portrayals. I, a vapor trail because you know some will say even it went way too far with I think power windows and presto and but I that, that's the era that I grew up in so that's when I became a Rush fan so I guess it depends on when you get on board. Subdivisions was on a bad album. Signals is not a good album, but um, it's a great song. I also had on on my wall growing up uh, the Grace Under Pressure album cover, which isn't a great album cover, but it's one that I have a biographical link to. But it's interesting in that early. 80s moment, uh, Rush were listening to the police and, and incorporating a kind of reggae sound into to, to some of their, their tracks like Vital Science. So I think we, we can't just see neo prog, if, if that was Rush in a neo prog guise, you know, it's reinvention of themselves, but it's taking in different kinds of musical inspiration, not just, you know, redoing classic, classic 70s prog in a slightly different way. Yeah, it's cool. Neil Peart was a huge fan of Stuart Copeland. Staying on the topic of, yes, this is something that it's so obvious now that you mentioned it in the book, but I just never really gave it much thought, but the alto tenor singing voices, John Anderson of Yes, Getty Lee of Rush, and this led to a rise in the number of female vocalists in progressive bands. And Martin, you did talk about female vocalists a while back, but that was, a, was and is a big part of progressive rock. Yes, yeah, so there's a whole chapter so in, in the revised edition. It's the first chapter in the, the third part, the beyond part. Um, and we want to both give prominence to that, um, but also to recognize that um, female musicians and singers, you know, have a role to play in the history of progressive rock, not just as a voice, not just as the, you know, Jackie Mashi or Annie Haslam of, uh, Pentacle, Pentangle and um, Renaissance being the front of the band, you know, we want to see the, them as being integral to thinking about the history of, of progressive rock. So Kate Bush, who is the most prominent case study in in, in the chapter on the female voice, isn't just um, a singer. I mean, she's a writer, she's a producer, you know, she has pretty much total control over 
over the recording process, even though there was a, a kind of a passing of the baton, you know, work with Peter Gabriel in the early days with Dave Gilmore as well. So there's a, there's a kind of a passing on the baton, but she's very much her own producer and, and creator. I think that's important. But going back to your question, Eric, I think the interest in prog bands having a, a high-pitched vocalist, whether it's John Anderson or Geddy Lee, you could either see, say is giving uh, tonality to progressive songs, giving them a kind of vertical reach as well as you know the horizontal reach of the, the narrative, um, or you could see it as kind of blocking out the possibility of a female vocalist coming in because it, it takes that space within the band. So I think you could argue it both ways, but very much going back to what I said a minute ago, we want to both acknowledge the importance of, of female musicians in the history of prog and to think about voice as being not just you know the front of the band, um, but very much an integral part of, of progressive music. What about post-progressive rock? Chapter 12 talks about this area of progressive rock. This term was designed to distinguish a type of rock music from the persistence of a progressive rock style that directly refers to 1970s Prague. When did this term, post-progressive rock, first emerge? And what bands were part of that shift? I went to go and check what Wikipedia says, and uh, pleasingly, we feature quite strongly in that. We think, what I think, I don't have all my books here, that Kevin Holm Hudson is the one who really kind of devises that idea. But the music was around long before the term was. So we say that the music is happening in the 80s, and it's people like David Sylvian, very often people that have left a band and go on something else like Peter Gabriel did. And Peter Gabriel arguably is quite a good example of it in his early albums, which is they're doing something that is has the aspirations of prog music, but using very different means to get there. But in the case of people like David Sylvian or Talk Talk, what we have is things that don't sound anything like 70s prog or even the 60s things we're talking about, uh, except maybe Miles Davis, but are instead trying to... Um, build long songs, have complex lyrical ideas, the artwork is really significant. They're doing all those things with a different starting point. And then that really expands in the 90s. So people like David Sylvian and um, Talk Talk, Stephen Wilson is the person to go and check with this because if he likes them, they're, they are more widely thought of as being important. So Tears for Fears apparently get caught. I think we mentioned them once. They're not really that significant as far as we see it. But you've got Cocteau Twins, you've got Talk Talk, um, those kind of bands feed into the 90s rebirth and people like Porcupine Tree and No Man come from that music and they start, you know, if the 70s bands started from jazz, classical music, a bit of blues, a bit of soul and put it all together with complexity, then in the 90s and 2000s, what we see are people that grew up in a different era and take those starting points. So our prime example is that Radiohead, I think that closed that chapter, are coming in and really vehemently anti-prog, uh, as we slightly scathingly say of Johnny Green, which says, we're not bloody prog or something like that, echoing Captain Sensible. And we say, yeah, that was probably before you did soundtracks, concertos, and all that instrumental stuff, was it? So he's come round in his way. But their sources are the 80s, those kind of 80s music. The 4AD label is really vital there, I think. Um, XTC, a whole range of things that sometimes we call indie or new wave even. And we kind of tried to pick out a slice of those and pick out the ones that were trying to do something more expanded in form and then say, okay, these are the reference points for prog music going forward. You know, the other bands can carry on, but these are the new reference points that we need to include. As we get to the 2000s, it was great to see the return of folk, but then again, did it ever go away? But the other side of the 2000s, the heavier side, heavy metal, progressive metal, Dream Theater, Tool, The Mars Volta, Porcupine Tree, This You Write begins gradually. Iron Maiden, an important figure in prog metal. Yeah, and don't forget Queensryche with Operation Mind Crime. Absolutely. That's a divisive concept album, if ever that is. You can listen, I can listen to it on one day and it's great. And another, it's like, uh, I might think something different about it. Let's put it that way. Diamond Head with Canterbury. Maybe this is just showing when we came into the story as listeners, as uh, young teenagers, that that era of early 80s rock, which and also includes that music from the elder as this weird outlier, 
is another source for people to do things a lot like progressive rock. So another way in which progressive rock in the 2000s doesn't start from the same place is it starts from that post-rock or post-progressive stuff from the 80s and 90s. It has this whole history of rock and metal that I think no one had really pieced together as a story. It just happened to be what those musicians had listened to. And Tool, certainly by the time, well, when Tool start off, they're into industrial music um, and perhaps grunge, I would say. And then by lateralis, they clicked into this other thing entirely. Um, and it's basically when I first, when that came out, I was thinking, uh, hang on, this is 80s King Crimson. Well, lo and behold, they then tour with King Crimson. And that's one of the linchpins of how we set up the argument of the book was knowing that, as well as Radiohead's OK Computer, another defining thing was that demonstrable link between Tool and King Crimson, that we could just, there's our proof, we're in. And that we knew we had something to kind of work on. And that, that remains the case. I'm not sure that the metal side has developed in the world too much. We've added a few more things and made it more international. And we're more interested in Townsend and people like that than we were before. Martin's introduced a couple, actually that's in the later chapter, but a couple of metal bands as well, who've really got these expanded concepts going on. Then there are ones that are quite hard to place, like Dream Theatre, we could have put maybe in more than one place in the book, for example, because they're not all just metal. We've decided to kind of include them as a kind of metal feature. And so, I think in so, high so, Porcupine Tree are maybe less metal, but I think the phase that we focus on, I think it's legitimate to call it that. I think you can see a development, you know, from that that eighties moment of, of heavy rock uh, over the uh, the last th three or four decades. But you could also um, see different routes into progressive rock. So in the final chapter on post conceptual prog, we look at Elder, a Massachusetts band, but now Berlin based, and they started off with as a drone band in the first couple of albums, but they've turned themselves into a progressive band, partly because they're influenced by European space rock and, and psychedelia, um, but also that they've they've grown and progressed a, 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 as artists. So Omens, uh, Reflections on the Floating World, uh, have that combination of, of drone and, and prog, uh, which are kind of surprising uh, inclusion perhaps but we think it's an important one because they've they've come to prog from a different perspective than thinking about you know the passing on the baton to a, to a new generation and i think in those cases they're not necessarily working in as much detail as we say they are from those sources we build the story but they're just coming and going we're metalists and we do this and oh hang on let's make an album that's all just about this theme and build really long songs about it. So they've got this totally separate way in. But I think we can see a bigger picture where they fit into this story from the early 80s onwards. I think it's quite a nice story. Well, I want to finish with where we're at right now in the year 2022. I wonder some of the younger musicians out there, the music that they're hearing, how it's getting to them, whether it's through YouTube, video games, streaming services, whatever that may be, how it's going to affect the music of the future. When you first started thinking about this book in the mid-90s, progressive rock was really struggling. Where is prog rock today, in your opinion, and what does the future hold for prog rock? Well, we haven't yet talked about edition three, which would be 20, 2031. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we've talked about the expanded dimension of prog and we think about it geographically we've said that there's more global elements in the, in the second edition and we've also reworked the subtitle so the subtitle of the first edition was uh, progressive rock since the 1960s we talked earlier with you eric about the importance of the 60s the new type the new subtitle is progressive rock across time and genre which is a kind of looser sense of two of the the key elements that we're exploring in the book uh, time and and genre but also a sense that they there isn't an end point uh, we talk about the centrifugal dimension of prog in the post-conceptual chapter the final chapter of the book the idea of radiating out so we we don't think that prog will run out of steam but it it might become you know um a sense that there's, there's too much to take into a single volume there are prog elements out there in many different forms across the whole uh, the whole musical spectrum the only other thing that i i think 
I'd like to say is that, and Paul might want to pick up on this, is that um, there's some really interesting instrumental prog bands. Um, in, in, instrumental tracks have been there from the very beginning, but with instrumental prog, you could be looser with concepts. You know, you don't have to have a, a story that has a narrative, however complex, like Landmeister on Broadway, or or how how simple in terms of thinking about you know the King Ar- the Arthurian legend of questing. With with instrumental tracks, you're not bound to stories and and the retelling of stories in in quite the same way. There's a a sense of you know being able to move in different sonic directions and you know su- suggestive of of different ideas rather than being fixed to a particular concept. So we give space to instrumental um, bands. Perhaps we can do more of that if we if there is a third third edition ever. Why wouldn't there be? Um, by the time we get to the third edition, we can be like on the sixth wave of Neo Prog, or it's going to be really complicated at the end of that chapter by then. But okay, one angle is look outside of the thing that's called progressive rock. And you know, near the end, we have Beyonce's Lemonade as a kind of good example of a coherent concept album that's brought together visually. We have Jan on Monet. I know that many people that like Prog will be going, that's well, you're going a long way out there. But that's not a failure either of prog or just trying to take everything over. It's like, what do we want from prog? We want extended pieces. We want complexity of some sort, whether that's the ideas, whether it's the playing. We want something that brings us artwork that goes with it. Those things can be found in lots of other places. Whilst at the same time, it seems quite a healthy moment for um, traditional prog. Like I think, yes, his last album is done. It's actually good. People seem to like it a bit. They're never going to sell no one's going to sell 100,000 copies. Everyone is screwed now in terms of sales. So you might as well make whatever music you want. I was going to say, yeah, take advantage of that. That's That changes how music is made. It has all throughout time. Late 60s when FM radio came and embraced the bands like Pink Floyd and Grateful Dead with a long form music, it affects what happens from that point on. So yeah, take advantage of the fact that streaming services are out there and you could, it was an album some band made an album that was just one whole song, like 30 minutes long. Might as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. And also on that, it was prog bands leading the way about debating with, let's say, streaming services, Robert Fripp arguing both with Sony and with Spotify. And that's long before you view Taylor Swift's doing that. So that's not just to say prog musicians are great, but also that they set an example. They have set an example for pop musicians, and another of those is the value of the album. A lot of artists want to retain control over albums and encourage the idea of an album. Uh, and if there's one thing, you know, maybe we're all dated by the era we've lived in, but I really think that something from 30 minutes to about 60, maybe a bit more, 120 of its prog, go on transatlantic. That's a form worth keeping. So look to those extended forms. And if a musician was actually asking me and they're already good at playing anything, I would get them listening to doom metal probably or some type of metal. That's why, why I would send them to, because they might be a bit wary of our electronic concept pop sides that we push at the end. Beyond and Before, the updated and expanded edition, Progressive Rock Across Time. So it's out now through Bloomsbury Academic. The expanded and updated edition came out in December. It's available wherever books are sold. Are there any websites and social media pages that you want readers and listeners to know about? If there's a way of including our Twitter avatars whatever they're called that would be good and 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 the the publisher's website we can send those to you eric if if they can go up as well absolutely everybody check the show notes page for those links guys this is great fascinating conversation fascinating book and if anybody has already gotten that first one they really should get this new edition because it's not just a few more pages just a few more notes and additions this is well worth picking up the new edition we we have to say is 100 pages longer many more images some fascinating artwork, a new chapter on post-conceptual prog, and quite a lot of expansion of chapters that we wrote before. Um, so there's a lot of new new material there. Martin Hollowell, Paul Haggerty, thanks so much for being on the podcast. No, thanks. Great fun. Thanks so much, Eric. Thanks to Paul Haggerty and Martin Hallowell for taking us through their book, Beyond and Before, updated and expanded edition, Progressive Rock Across Time and Genre. If you have a local independent bookstore, pick up a copy there and support not just Paul and Martin, but your local independent bookstore. A link to find your nearest bookstore is on our website, bookedonrock.com. 
Subscribe to Booked on Rock at Spreaker or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. We're on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, TuneIn, YouTube, and more. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash booked on rock podcast. On Twitter at booked on rock. The email address, the booked on rock podcast at gmail.com. If you're a publisher or author of a book on rock and you want to be on the podcast, send me an email or contact me through our website, bookedonrock.com. I'm Eric Senich. Thanks for listening. And join me again next time for another episode of Booked on Rock.